So at the outset, I would like to uh, say a word that I am really thrilled. I am really thrilled that my kids in this church, you are well equipped for this seminar. The seminar topic, as I mentioned, and we published through our flyers, it is Parimaritrimeni, the man of God. The man of God. Why I choose that topic? Because we are, we all are humans. We all are humans, made out of soil. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our earthly body. With this body, we are going to glorify God, we are going to praise God, we are going to intercede through the Parimaritrimeni. So if with this soulish body, if we can praise God, then definitely we can be near to God with this body. Parimaritrimeni, a human being, elevated to the highest hierarchical authority of the church as a bishop, he devoted himself to the at most dedication to the power of the Holy Spirit. That is why the church now really accepts and admits Parivala Trivani as the first declared saint. If Parivala Trivani can reach that zenith, why couldn't we? Definitely, if we are trying, we can be. This is why I chose the term Parivala Trivani, the man of God. And today, my students, my kids of this church, you are going to present six papers, five papers, uh, in connection with the topic, Parimala Trivedi, the man of God. So I would like to invite Jenny to moderate these sessions with an introductory speech from her. God bless you all. Thank you. Respected Achin, friends and family, welcome to our seminar. When Achin first asked me to um, to conduct uh, this seminar about Parmelthi, I was really happy because Parmelthi really has a special place in my heart. Um, as uh, my mother is from Malnar, and from uh, being from Malnar, Parmelthi and the church there was very special to her. So uh, growing up, we always heard about Parmadhanamini. So when growing up in, in the U.S., I would go to uh, India and visit the Parmadhanamini church, Parmadhanamini's church. And then I would see thousands and thousands of people, and I want to share the story with you, because of my personal connection with him. So every year we would go, and my earliest, um, earliest uh, recollection was at the age of seven. So uh, every year we would go and I see thousands of people going to the church and praying. And then there was his, um, his bed that is encased in glass. How many of you youngsters have been to the church? Raise your hand. Okay, so not everybody. So there's a case with his bed that is uh, that's enclosed in a, in a glass case, okay? And um, at the church you'll see so many people touching it and praying. So at the age of seven, my mother said, you know, why don't you go up there, say your prayers, touch it. I said, Mom, you really want me to touch that? There's so many people, uh, you know, I feel really funny. So I did. But then after that, I washed my hands. Okay, this was at the age of seven, because I found it a little strange that everybody was touching it. Each year, I would do the same thing. I touch it, but then I touch it just briefly. very briefly and then I go and wash my hands. Okay. So something happened when I was 10 years old during our visit to India. Uh, I went and visited the church and we actually visited uh, late in our trip the day before we were leaving to come back to the U.S. And that year I did the same thing. I went and prayed but I just touched it very briefly and then I went and washed my hands. But this time it was a very special, not a special feeling, but a very weird feeling. My fingers started to burn. All my fingers, all my ten, ten fingers started to burn. So I was really worried. So I went back into the church and I put both of my hands on that glass and I really prayed. And I, I prayed for forgiveness. Because at that age, you know, being ten, you don't really know much. Um, but it was really something because as soon as I touched my hands on the glass, 
the pain went away. So it was something that I really truly believe from that point on that buttermethinamine has um, special powers. And uh, so I, my belief in him is very strong. So therefore, as a mother, I will continue to bring that tradition to my children as well. So, um, so that is my uh, personal story with Bano Tirmini. So we're going to start our seminar. And the children, like Ashton said, did a wonderful job in, in preparing. So please help me welcome Vanessa, who's going to talk about Bano Tirmini's early childhood and education. <coughs> Respected Ajin, moderator Jenny Andy, parents and friends, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the childhood and education of St. Gregorios. St. Gregorios was born on June 15, 1848. He was the youngest son of his blessed parents, Kochu Matai and Maria of the Parthatuturati. He was baptized by the name of Guy Varghese at his home parish, the Malarati Marthoma Church. St. Gregorios has two brothers, Karian and Varghese. He also had two sisters. St. Gregorios, his parents, and siblings all live in Canada. However, after the death of their grandparents, the whole family moved to the Jadarati house, which was built on his father's ancestral property. St. Gregorios was born on, and brought up in this house, and hence is often referred as the Jadarati Thurman. He was the youngest in his family. They gave him the pet name Kochibara. At the age of five years old, he started his formal education. His teacher was Omuk Aya, a local Hindu teacher. His respect for the teacher was so great that many times when St. Gregorios visited his native village after becoming a high priest, he would personally contact and offer gifts to the Nilsutu Ashram. And it is heard at those meetings he would not even sit in the presence of his teacher. Later, he continued his studies under the Mamuto Mani Ashram, a tradition, traditional village school. The place where St. Gregorios started his primary education was later converted into a shrine in the name of St. Gregor. The foundation stone was laid by Metropolitan Mark Felixinos Palos of Canadon, this year, on December 8, 1963, and the sacred relic of St. Gregorio's Jadarati was established here on June 15, 1866, by the Catholic Mark Basilios. This place is located in the main roadside near Perimpoli St. George Shima Shana Church, and not much, at, not much far away from the Malarati Mark Thoman Church. The Perimpali Simhashana Church stands on the, stands on the site where a small school was started by Paramelo Thinamini over a hundred years ago, where he used to spend long hours in meditation and solitude. Kashiso Samberko Palatatu Givargi Malapan, a known Syriac scholar and a celibate priest, teaching Syriac and theology to seminarians at the Monotherapy Church, was St. Gregorios' uncle. Noticing his nephew's studious nature and noble character, Kashiso Givardis undertook his coaching. The boy studied theology in Syria from his uncle, who was an authority in it. Proper guidance was given by Kashiso Givardis. He helped young St. Gregorios to lead a pious life. Even at this young age, many observed a spiritual ability and intelligence in St. Gregorios. He was more inclined to prayers, reading the Holy Bible, and listening to the stories of saints. The young boy was not very interested in worldly pleasures or the gaieties of life. He had a sharp intellect and a wonderful memory, too. His powers and observations and insight were very keen and penetrating. At this young age itself, he was able to sing Syriac hymns in proper rhythm and diction. The influence of his uncle had an exceptional effect on young St. Gregorios. His interest in spiritual matters grew day by day, and Kashisho Givarghese, who was well aware about his nephew's spiritual thirst, wanted him to be raised in priesthood. Thank you. children. So he had two brothers and two sisters. Brothers and two sisters. So they always referred to him as the, the youngest in the family. And uh, his uncle, his father's brother, who was a very um, scholar in Syriac language, he's the one that took him under his wings and taught uh, Didimini from a very young age, uh, I believe at the age of five. Um, so the, the uncle also had a great influence. Because at that time, children got married very young, and there was a story that Dimini's father wanted to marry him off at the age of 12. But Dimini's desire was to remain celibate, and like his uncle, so he did get his uncle's support to do that. And later on, his family understood that this was the right decision for him. Um, at a young age, as Vanessa said, he was very inclined to prayer, to reading the Bible, 
and also to hearing stories about other saints as well. And, um, so, and then the last point of, is about uh, his uncle. So um, the next speaker that I'm going to call up is Manisha, and Manisha is going to talk about the ordination of St. Gregorios. Respected Achin, moderator, Jenny Andi, parents, families, and friends. Saint Givergis Margri Gorios, also known as Padamano Tirimeni, was born on June 15, 1848, and passed away on November 2, 1902. At a very young age, Saint Gregorios had shown keen interest in spiritual matters. At the age of 10, on Sleva Perimal Day of the year 1857, Metropolitan of Manangara Pala Matthews more Athanasius ordained young St. Gregorius as a subdeacon at the Karinkachira St. George Jacobite Syrian Church. Within no time, Thirumini became a beloved companion of Morkurios Yuakim. During this time, he came to know about our church fathers, their life, commitment, church's rich traditions, and etc. St. Anthony, the third century Coptic monk became his role model. Later, when Dinamini understood the relevance of proper priesthood and the laying of hands, he decided to accept reordination from the first stage of priesthood. Thus, in October 1864, St. Gregorius was reordained full deacon. A year after, in November, December 1865, Joachim Morkurios Bava ordained Deacon Gieberges as a priest, and was later elevated as Cora Episcopa. The young Cora Episcopa continued to be with more glorious Joachim as his personal secretary for some more periods. He became a valiant protector of Antioch Malangara relationships, which we can witness through his later day life. The Syrian seminary at Corteum which is now popularly known as the Old Seminary, was started by more Dionysius II. However, the institution fell later into the hands of the European missionaries, and the Syrian church was left with nothing. So more Dionysius V was compelled to start another seminary for the training of clergy. Polycorto Tiremeni found Palmyra. Later, when the church searched for a person to lead the seminary, it was the name of our young and dynamic Syriac school scholar, Chaudhuriti Givergiskor Episcopa, which was suggested by Puli Kordel Thirumeni. On Sunday, the 7th of April, 1872, at the age of 24, Puli Kordel, more Dionysius, Metropolitan raised Chaudhuriti Givergiskor Episcopa to the Order of Ramban at the Mulanduriti Marthoman Church and appointed him the Mopan of the new seminary at Parmola. The Patriarch, on reaching Malangara in 1875, initially spent most of his time at the Marthoman Church, Mulanduriti. Ramban Givar Gis was then serving as one of the priests at that church. More Dionysius V, who was aware of the Ramban's proficiency and appointed him as the translator to the Patriarch. Greatly impressed, His Holiness appointed him his private secretary. Finally, when the church decided to consecrate six new metropolitans for the proposed diocese, the patriarch's primary choice was the young and religious Ramban Givergis. The patriarch was so impressed by his simplicity, humility, and spiritual fervor. The Ramban wanted to remain a monk. He requested the patriarch to leave, relieve him from being ordained. However, under continuous persuasion, the Ramban changed his mind. Sunday, the 10th of December, 1876, the preacher, more, more Ignatius Patros III, ordained two more metropolitans at the North Harbour St. Thomas Church. And among, one of the, among them was our Chaudhuriti Givergi <coughs> Ramban, who was ordained by the name more Gregorios. And the other was Ambata Givergi Ramban, who was ordained by the name more Gregorios Givergi. Metropolitan Mark Gregorios Givergis Chaudhuri was only 29 at the time of his consecration, and his young, 
and was the youngest of all the newly ordained bishops. Hence, he was affectionately called the called Cochitrimi. From the time he was ordained a high priest for Nirinam diocese, he was staying at Parmala. It has become his second home. Thus, he came to be called Parmala Tirmini as well. The Holy Father's short life was remarkable in many respects. A deacon at age 10, a priest at age 18, a bishop at the young age of 28. He passed away at the age of 54 on the 2nd of November, 1902, after a stately life of prayers to become the brightest jewel of the Universal Syrian Church. Thank you. So we know that uh, Dinamini became a deacon at the age of 10. Uh, he became a priest at the age of 18, and later he was uh, promoted to Corpuscopa. At the age of 24, Dinamini was raised to the order of Ramban and was appointed the uh, Malpan of the new seminary at Okay. In 1875, Dinamini was appointed as the Patriarch's translator during his visit to India and then the patriarch was so impressed with him that he made him his private secretary. On December 10, 1876, the patriarch ordained uh, Thaluti Vivari Ramban as a metropolitan with the name Mor Gregorios. He was the youngest metropolitan to be ordained as a bishop and therefore was given the nickname Pochilirmen. So our next topic is going to be about the Dmini's visit to the Holy Land, and this is going to be given by Mrs. Uh, Shiji Vinod. Introduction, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. As you all see here, uh, my topic is on Dmini's visit to the Holy Land. Dmini's visit to the Holy Land in 1895 was a landmark event in all aspects because he was the first Indian bishop to visit the Holy Land. Tirmeni had a great desire to visit the Holy Land because he emphasized more on seeing and believing than on hearing and believing. Not only that, he had an intention to feel and comprehend and experience the soil which bore the footprints of Jesus Christ. Not only that, the title Gregorios, which he got at the time of Metropolitan Consecration, was the honorable title of Mark Gregorius, the Archbishop of Jerusalem. So that all helped him and the desire to go to Jerusalem. And he needed help, the financial help. So he issued a kalpana throughout all Syrian Orthodox churches that he needs money to go to Jerusalem. So many metropolitans, many churches helped him. Also he visited many Indian churches so that he could get financial help. Within three months, he collected rupees 5,000 and which helped him to visit the Holy Land. Kuchu Tirumeni, he started his journey on 19 February, accompanied by many other deacons, and they reached the Holy Land on 7th April. They were welcomed by a large gathering under the leadership of Mar Gregorios Guy Varghese, the Archbishop of Jerusalem. They stayed at St. Mark Daira. St. Mark Daira, if you, if you all know that, St. Mark Daira is one of the historically important positions of Syrian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem because St. Mark Daira is a place where Jesus had his last supper. Tirmini uh, also visited many important historical places like the Holy Tomb of Jesus Christ, the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus was tried, tomb of St. Mary, throne of St. James, uh, tomb of King David, and all other important historical places. He, he led prayers at various Syrian Orthodox Church, and also he had, um, he had a chance to celebrate Kurbana at the St. Mark Diara. All this happened at the Passion Week. And on 22nd April, after a brief visit of 16 days, he came back to India. In a month's time after his return, Thirumeli wrote all his experience about his journey in, um, in, a, in a travelogue under the name of Yerushalayim Yatra Vivarnam. 
This book is considered as the first Malayalam travelogue and not only really that about this book, this travelogue is unique in its elegance of its style because he has written all his experience about his journey in it. And not, uh, after this visit, it resulted in a starting of a new era because we had a, cord a new era of cordial relationship with the members of our mother church in Jerusalem. After this, um, after this visit, Tirumeni understood the need of English education um, and later on he started the foundation or he laid the foundation of English medium schools. In one of his speech he had mentioned that true God is worshipped neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem but in spirit and truth. I would like to conclude this topic with one of his saying, pray earnestly to God during day and night such prayer is the best way to remove darkness and fatigue in us and also the means to attain salvation and kingdom of heaven. So put your faith in God and pray to him. Thank you. So what we learned here was that Dignani had a great desire to visit the Holy Land and um, his desire happened in, uh, he started in February 19, in 1895, and he got there only on uh, April 7th, so it's more than a, almost a month and a half to get from India all the way to Jerusalem. That's a very long time. So uh, he stayed there for 16 days. As Shuji said, he stayed at uh, St. Mark's Dairo, which is one of the oldest Syrian Orthodox churches there. Um, he wrote a book about his uh, his travel, his, his experiences, the people that he met, the places that he's seen. Um, so that was great for everyone to read. And then when he got back, he actually raised money to have a big uh, silver cross made. And after he had that made, he sent it over to the church in Jerusalem so they can use it for their possessions. So as a result of the trip, the Dimeni understood the importance for English education and later built many English medium schools because he knew, you know, once you travel, you understand that it's really important to learn about worldly things. And he understood the, um, the importance of English and having English medium schools for the children of India. So, great. So our next topic is going to be about social involvement and it is given by Joby Phillips. identity and my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, is a spiritually moribund religion awaiting burial. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King spoke these words in 1960, just as he was gaining national attention for being a civil rights leader in America. When he spoke these words, you could hear in his voice the echoes of many men who came before his time and fought for the same idea. The idea that religion was more than just an abstract ideal. The idea that the church had a role in society. The idea that the Christianity practiced by the Nazis and the KKK was no kind of Christianity. One of the voices that spoke out against the injustices of his own time was our Paramount Damien. During his life, he changed our church's role in the community. He fought for and risked his reputation and his life for the same idea that Dr. King expressed over a half century later. At the, at the time of, the the of Tirmini's life, there was a great and terrible injustice that was an ongoing reality in Indian society. You see, we read a lot about other systems of organized injustice, such as the apartheid, segregation, slavery. Um, but one thing that goes <coughs> overlooked, or that gets less attention, was the Indian caste system. Now, the caste system was designed as a, uh, as a pyramid to keep the lowest the most unfortunate people in society down and to protect the wealth and power of the, the people on top of the pyramid. And in any system of such organized oppression, one of the key things that, uh, that was the basis of it was denying education. So the lower caste people or the Dalit, 
uh, what we call the Dalit classes. They had no resource of education. Uh, one of the things that was forbidden was that uh, these children would be educated with the same in the same schools or have contact with the same uh, with the children of the upper caste people. So Tirmeni saw that this was an injustice that needed to be corrected, and he saw the importance of having separate schools for these children. He tried to give them hope and inspiration at a time when most people treated them with contempt and disdain. Our own church, very important church officials, thought that this was a bad idea to change the status quo and to make enemies with a, with a powerful group of people to protect those less fortunate. But Tirmeni knew uh, that uh, uh, the idea that he believed to be the right thing to do in his heart, and it inspired him to soldier on his mission. His cause to gain equal rights for the Dalits reminded me of a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. He made social reformation and education equality a part of the church's mission. He took up the cause of the oppressed without regard to what the upstanding citizens would say about his work. He became a force in the movement to attain freedom for the Dalit people. He was able to establish English, five English schools in Mulundarati, Tirivilla, Kandangolam, Niranam, and Tumaman. These schools became a symbol of social reformation, of Kerala and for India. He made it possible for these people to believe that things can change for them, that they too have a place in this new India. Between 19, 1895 and 1902, he brought his vision to fruition with these schools. Having shaken the core and forced change upon the church that he loved, he then sought to redefine the concept of missionary work for the church clergy. St. Gregorius was the first one to organize mission work within the church. He pushed the church to give priority to uh, missionary work both inside and outside the church. He was a man who practiced all the things he preached. So he not only organized it, but he exemplified it in a great way. He, uh, when uh, Tumbaman and the surrounding areas were hit with the devastating smallpox epidemic, he personally visited every home that was affected. Every, he comforted and prayed with all the sick people. Many of his loved ones and the, those close to him repeatedly and loudly protested his visit, citing the risk to his own health. But Tirmeni refused to be deterred. His faith and actions gained him many admirers. And during his own lifetime, he, he walked as a living legend. He was an ordinary saint because he prayed fervently or he sang beautifully, because he did do those things. He was ordained a saint because he stood up for the oppressed, because he spoke for those people without a voice that he took pride in defending the people who were neglected and trampled upon by society. His actions spoke louder than many words and they echoed throughout history in every struggle for equality. From Gandhi to Mandela to Dr. King, his memory represents the best qualities of our church and remains an enduring appeal, an enduring symbol of Christian love. Thank you. before, uh, he didn't really understood the importance of having those English meeting schools, and so he was able to establish them in many areas. He took care of the people who were affected by smallpox, and also, just so that you also know, when his uncle had smallpox and he died, then many also did get smallpox at that time. And back then, if you had gotten a disease like smallpox, it was very rare that you survived. But he did survive uh, by a miracle, and he was actually taken care of by his um, sister, Miriam. Um, he believed the church should engage in educational activities, especially to facilitate English teachings without discriminating gender or religion. Then many started an outreach program for children in lower communities. He organized an evangel evangelical awakening program for non-Christians. And his major task was to motivate clergy for effective ministry. He wanted to make sure that the deacons, that, as during his era, they were really effective in teaching people to be close to God. Um, so he really paid attention to how he taught his deacons. So uh, in the next section, we're actually going to talk about the contributions of the church. And we don't have a paper on uh, contributions, so I'm just going to give you some highlights. Um, Thirimeni established the first Malankara Syrian Orthodox Clergy Association. He built a church and a seminary in Parimala. 
Uh, he started schools and he had three major activities. One was the diocese administration, the ministerial formation of deacons. Like I said, he focused on his deacons. He really wanted to make sure there were deacons um, that you know followed him spiritually as well, and his missionary work. So three major activities for him. Okay. In the uh, next section, we're going to talk about the last minutes of Padmanabhan, and that's going to be given by Ashley Joseph. Respected Achin, a modern Udayanandi, parents and brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. My topic was on Paramela Didimini's last minutes. Paramela Didimini suffered lingering disease of bile. Three months before the death of Paramela Didimini, he was taken care by Father Kuchu Koshi, his most trustful disciple. Paramela Didimini's sickness didn't improve after Ayurvedic treatment. Since there wasn't any improvement, Didimini was predicting his death. After the news spread, Many faithfuls came to visit from afar. Many faithfuls living by brought food to those who visited. Also, the news of Didymenes' serious illness shocked more Dionysius, who was a good friend and disciple to Didymenes. <coughs> Kuchu Didymenes became weaker and weaker. Five days before his death, he left his key to his document to his chief disciple, Patashero Givardi's Malpan. Two days before his death, he said to those around, around him, My Lord, I must endure this pain for two more days, sighed the grace. On November 2nd, 1902, the great saint of Malangara left the world, submitting his soul to the Heavenly Father. Thank you. So from Ashley's paper, we understand that Dimitri suffered from piles, and his, his condition actually uh, worse as he was um, as go between September and, October, and November. Um, Father Koshi was asked to stay with Dimitri to take care of him. There was actually a story. Dimitri uh, was conducting a marriage in September, and during the marriage, of, um, when he was blessing of the rings, one of the rings fell down. Um, and then people thought this was a really bad omen for the, for the married couple. But he actually told uh, the family and friends, you know, need not worry, this is not a bad omen. But however, this will be the last time that I will be conducting a marriage. And it really was, because he died in November. Um, so as soon as uh, everybody found out about the Dimitri being sick, a lot of people from all over India came to visit him. And Dinamini had a rule, if they, people come to visit him at uh, his home, they were to be fed food. So a lot of the local people prepared food every single day so they could feed all these, um, all these guests. Vatasol Gigvarkis Kanarathar was entrusted with the, the cross, his staff, and the keys. And he said um, to his priests that were by his side, Oh my Lord, I must endure this pain for two more days. So he actually knew that he was dying on November 2nd. And his last words were, my Lord. So our last topic is going to be about Padmanath Thinamani, the great master, and that's going to be given by Megan. Respected Achin, Moderator Janianti, parents and friends, I thank you all for joining us today in our church Panama. Today I will be talking to you about a great master. This great master is also known as Padamela Thinamini. Padamela Thinamini's life was one of righteousness and holiness. Thinamini was one to believe that prayer is the inspiration of childhood, the refuge of youth and peace during middle age during old age. Dinamini would always pray earnestly to God every day and night. He believed that when we pray with a heart full of devotion, God will accept our prayers and we will then receive blessings in return. 
Prayer is in many ways the golden chain that binds this world to the feet of God. Padma Thirimani would always tell his fellow deacons to always put their faith in God and pray to God every day. Now I am going to discuss a story to you about Padma Thirimani. One day, Thirimani had a huge swelling on his back, and the, doc the doctor said that it could be very painful and dangerous. The disciples and servants of Thirimani became very scared and worried, but Thirimani was not afraid at all. Later on, his father found out about a severe swelling and sent some Ayurvedic medicine for Thirimani. Even though Thirimani did not refuse it, he did not use it either. The servants tried to convince Thirimani to apply the medicine on his back, and he said to them, Do not worry, this swelling came on its own, therefore it will subside on its own. This goes to show that Thirimani's faith in God is unshakable. Another thing Paramahala Thirimani was adamant about was fasting. Fasting is the feast of the soul, and good fasts are like medicine that cures our soul and mind, and along with other virtuous works, it leads us to eternal life. Paramahala Thirimani always urged everyone to fast and do works of charity and faith and with faith and devotion. Jesus said only through prayer and fasting we could succeed our battle against the evil forces of this world. This is the way that our forefathers and mothers showed us through their lives. Especially our patron Saint Panama Thirimani was a champion on this way. As we are going to celebrate the feast of Panama Thirimani today and tomorrow, let us also try to go the same path that Panama Thirimani has walked. Thank you. Okay, so we know from today's seminar that the man was very devoted to prayer and to God. Even during time of distress and turmoil, he never turned away from God. Severe sickness and pain during his death did not lead him to falter as a man of God. On the man's 45th Memorial Day, he was canonized as the first declared saint of Malankara Orthodox Church. <coughs> So I hope you um, had a chance to you know, really think about it and reflect on Minnie's life. Um, hopefully everybody learned something new, especially the young children. And this concludes our seminar, and I'll just uh, give closing remarks uh, by Etchen. So thank you, Jenny, and those were present with papers. Actually, we know everything about Parimala Thirimani, but once in a while, if you hear something like this, it may trigger it to our. Many of us may not be familiar that Thirimani was signed as the private secretary of the Patriarch of Frontier. Many of you may not realize that. A man from the village of Chaturiti became the secretary of the Supreme Head of the Sri Orthodox Church. These sort of things we got a chance to hear about. Shamasin, please join us. And I would like to congratulate and thank Jenny for this tremendous work. Uh, definitely, it's a good start for our church. So, and my as the kids of the church and the seniors, those who presented the papers, you did an excellent job, wonderful research, and definitely we will publish these papers. Definitely we will publish these papers. And within 48 hours or 72 hours, it will be in YouTube, and uh, you are going to witness it directly. And again, you can think and you can meditate on these topics and come up with new, more stuff. God bless you, everybody.